You better tell somebody. Join us for the Super Bowl tonight. It's going to be a great time. Bring a friend and bring a snack for our halftime food fest. See you this evening. We challenge you to test God in tithing for 90 days. The 90-day tithing challenge begins Sunday, February 1st. Test God for 90 days and see if your life is not blessed when you begin tithing. We are beginning life-changing ministry for men and women on February the 8th, Sunday nights at 5 o'clock. The men will meet using Fathered by God by John Eldridge, and the ladies will be using Becoming Myself by Stacy Eldridge. You really don't want to miss what God's going to do in these men's and women's classes. The books are available online or at a local Christian bookstore. Bring a friend, and we'll see you there for food, fellowship, and life-changing ministry. Sign up today for a Christ Church Encounter, life-changing ministry February the 20th and 21st with an overnight stay at Paul B. Johnson State Park. It's going to be incredible. Sign up with Miss Jennifer today. You may give electronically at Christchurch.tv or in the rear of the sanctuary. You may now come and give as unto the Lord.
Not talking about anybody that's perfect, but people who are a whole lot better than they used to be. Oh, thank God for Jesus Christ and for the church. Amen. Uh, how many of you were in life group Wednesday night? Amen. There you go. Well, I began a sermon on Wednesday night, uh, a sermon series rather, and the title of the sermon series is Who's On First? Who's On First? And, and I was arranging for special guests Abbott and Costello to be with us today, uh, and that's who was trying to peek through the curtain, but they didn't make it. And so... Tell somebody that didn't go, say, you got to go to life group. group. If you'd have went to life group, you'd have already seen it. Amen. You'd have already seen it. But I, I want to take just a moment and thank everyone who came to our work day yesterday. I want to take just a moment and uh, thank God for great leadership, Amen. wonderful leadership here at Christ Church. And it's so good to see my cousin Teresa here. All right. Awesome. And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to get straight into the Word of God if Abbott and Costello does not appear. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you for what you're going to do during this service, Lord. Lord, we just come to you with clean minds and open hearts, and Lord, we lay aside every distraction. And Lord, we know that it's not so important what a preacher says, but what the Holy Ghost says inside of us about what a preacher says. And Lord, we're just all ears to hear what your spirit would say to the church today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. and amen. And here we go. The title of my message is Who's On First? That's the sermon series that we're going to be going. And I'm going to talk to you today about service. Service. Those who attended Life Group, like all good Christians should, <laughs> have already got a preview of what we're going to be talking about. It, it, it's, a, it's a great skit and it never gets old. Amen. But who's on first is a seemingly simple question. But... Those of you who saw the skit knows that it's a question that can bring about an awful lot of confusion. Yeah. Who's on first can get people really worked up and, and really confused. And really, it's not so much the question that brings confusion so much as it is the fact that the question exposes the confusion okay. that's already present in people's lives. It's not that the question causes confusion so much as it just exposes confusion that's already going on in people's lives. And I speak with people often who, who find that they do not feel as close to God as they once did. People who no longer enjoy church like they used to enjoy church. People who no longer serve the way that they once served. And, and they seem no longer to enjoy life as much as perhaps they once did. And I, I, I don't want to give you too simple of an answer this morning. I, I, I don't want to hit you with the wrong brush. Uh, I mean, it's a fact that there is a rising and falling in all of mortal man's relationships. Uh, C.S. Lewis called it the law of undulation. It's like waves on the shore of the sea. There is a fluctuation in every relationship that you have. Including your relationship with God. Don't let the devil fool you. Nobody dances on clouds all the time. Some folk just put on a better show than others. Amen. Yet, maybe, perhaps, if you no longer enjoy spending time with Christ and spending time with the body of Christ the way that you once did, I don't know, but could it be 
Can it be that your diminishing joy in life is coming from the fact that God is no longer first in your life? Could it be? Maybe. The centerpiece of Jesus' longest sermon that he ever preached is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I don't want nobody looking too mean at me this morning. But I'm going to mess with you just a little today. So go ahead and practice a smile before we get started. Come on, practice. All right, y'all looking good. Y'all looking good. I, I, I'm going to ask you a few serious questions this morning. And, and, and I won't be surprised if the amen board resigns. I, 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 I won't hold it against you. This time. And the whole reason for this sermon series is not to upset folk. It's not to mess with people. But the purpose of this sermon series is to give you hope this morning. Hope for the joy that's been missing out of your life for quite some time. Hope for the provision and the finance that you need but don't have. Hope that your marriage can be good again. And that your needs can be met. Hope that you can have a home run of a family. And a home run of a ministry. Hope that you can have a home run business one day. Hope. That a home run. Is still possible. In your life. All these things are possible. When you have the answer. To one. Very important question correct today we're looking at a very important time in the life of Jesus and the question that we all must answer is who's on first who's on first in your life this morning we're going to learn some things from what Jesus did just a few days before he knew that he was going to die. Our story begins in John chapter 13. And I'm just going to begin reading there in verse 1. He says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Somebody say he knew. He knew. He, he knew. I mean, he knew that his time had come. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid his garments aside. He took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This passage is powerful. This passage is mind-blowingly powerful. Jesus was going to die in just a matter of hours. And so you and I cannot possibly imagine the importance that he must have placed on every action that he completed in the hours before his death. This was on Thursday evening at supper time. And on Friday evening, Jesus knew that he was going to be hanging on a cross. What would you do if you knew you were going to be hanging on a cross? 
going to die at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Would you still fuss like you've been fussing when you got home from church? If you knew you were going to die at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Would the issues you've been having with your family still be the issue if you knew your time was coming tomorrow? Would what somebody said on Facebook even matter to you at all? If you knew. Or would you do things differently, perhaps, for the time that you have left? You hear people talking about things that they want to do before they die. My wife's talking about going to Spain and seeing Venice. Or Venice, as she said. People have all sorts of things that they think that are important. Of course, I don't think she's planning on waiting very long. She's talking about going to Spain now. People have all sorts of things that they would like to do that they think are important, and they'd like to do it before they die. But Jesus is the only one I ever heard of that decided to wash 12 grown men's stinking feet just hours before he knew he was going to die. Now, if you had the ability to know when you were going to die, what would you do? Well, I know what you would do. You would prioritize how you spent the time that you had left. Only things of the utmost importance would make it on to your schedule for the amount of time that you had li left. And so it looks so strange to begin with that washing, Jesus, Je washing feet made it onto Jesus' bucket list. I mean, that just looks kind of crazy, doesn't it? Jesus prioritized getting up from the table and getting down on the floor and washing someone's feet. And the importance of this is actually a life-altering, unimaginable blessing for the folk who can get a hold of it. It will change your life. It puts life in a whole new perspective and it brings you a grace and a peace that most people never understand because most people cannot receive this blessing and most people do not walk in this anointing because most people are unwilling to get up from the table where they are being fed in order to get down on the floor and serve somebody else. People who eat and eat and eat and never put anything out. Never receive this kind of peace or this kind of anointing or this kind of blessing. People who only take in but never pour out cannot know what it is like to walk in this level of peace. People who sit waiting for somebody else to create an atmosphere of worship. In the house, never know about it. People who sit waiting for somebody else to take their ministry to the next level, never walk in this anointing. People who are waiting for you to make them into something. Instead of getting up and doing something. Never walk into this level of grace and anointing that I'm talking about this morning. It's an anointing that you just don't get sitting at the table. Now you've got to see the picture and you've got to see it right. Jesus did not get up from the table and immediately begin washing people's feet. Jesus got up from the table and the Bible is clear that he laid aside his own garments. And then he got the basin and then he got the towel. 
You know, it's often been said that the clothes make the man. And I can tell you it's true that a, a fine suit can feel like a great piece of art. I, I love a fine suit. I mean, that's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But I have to disagree with the saying. I believe it is not the clothes that make the man. But the man chooses his clothes to reflect himself and reflect how he perceives himself and what is going on inside of him. Ask anyone. Ask anyone. Clothing is a reflection of personality and personal choice. You choose your clothes to represent you. If you're going to experience next level anointing, then not only will you have to get up from the table, you will also have to lay aside your personal agenda and your personal hangups and your personal likes and dislikes in order to participate in something that's bigger than your personality, bigger than who you're mad at, bigger than what you like and what you don't like, bigger than What somebody said about you. Yeah. Bigger than. <laughs> the anger you're holding against people. Bigger than. On, what somebody said on Facebook. Bigger than. Right. Your hurt feelings. Right. Wow. Amen. Amen. We cannot truly serve God and our own agendas at the same time. Go ahead and pray. You can do it in this house. We cannot accomplish our agenda and God's glory. No man can serve two masters. Turn around and ask somebody, say, who's on first? And you know that it's true. Selfish, selfish people do not walk in anointing. Amen. That, that'd be good to write down too. Sing all you want. Preach how you will. Work however much you are able. But the anointing will not flow. When you're always playing at being first. It just don't work that way. Here's another truth. You could write it down. Selfish people don't serve. I think they got off the boat, Lord. <laughs> Selfish people don't serve. They do not serve God. They do not serve their families. They do not serve their wife. They do not serve their husband. They do not serve in the local church. They do not serve in the local school. They do not serve their community. Selfish people do not serve. For these people, everything is centered on their comfort. Everything rests and is centered on their well-being. Everything is focused on them. And there's a lot of focus on how you treat them. They do not serve, but they love to be served. They like to be served and they love to evaluate They love to evaluate with their very high standards the kind of service that you're giving to them. They have very high standards about what it takes to please them. But it never occurs to them that they should serve somebody themselves. Go ahead, you can do that. They complain 
about the choir, but they never joined the choir. They were down the children's ministry, but they never volunteered to help in the children's ministry or lift a finger to do anything about it. They fuss about the cleanliness of the facility, but they never stoop down and pick up a piece of paper out of the yard of the church that blew over from across the street. And, and if you go into a restaurant with them, they will act like a fool in front of God and everybody. If they had to wait on their food, I mean, folk at work been waiting on them for weeks for them to complete something. I mean, folks been waiting days and days for them to complete something. But they get in a restaurant, and if the food is five minutes late, they're talking about, I want to talk to the manager. I ain't got my cheese sticks yet.
once before Jesus was seated at dinner in the house of a Pharisee, one that he had healed and cleansed from leprosy. Yeah. And all of his disciples were seated with him, and nobody had washed Jesus' feet. All right. All right. No doubt the Pharisees meant it for an insult to invite him to dinner, but then show him no honor and no hospitality. And none of the disciples had enough gumption to say, you're not going to insult my master like that. If you won't wash his feet, that's all right. I'll wash his feet because I honor him. I know who he is and I know what he's done for me. You may not wash his feet, but I will. No, they just trotted on inside being cute. And sat at the table with all of the Pharisees and with Jesus, enduring the insult. Enduring the insult and unwilling to do what is necessary to take the insult away. And on that occasion, a woman that was not even part of the church. I mean, she wasn't even church folks. She didn't even know when to say amen or when to say hallelujah. She, she didn't have none of that figured out yet. She was from completely outside. And on that occasion, this woman came in off the street. And she washed his feet with her tears. And she dried them with her hair. What a shame. For Jesus to be surrounded by people he had saved and people he had been healed. And yet none of them are willing to serve to the point that a sinner needs to come in off the street and begin to do what the folk who said they loved him should have been doing from the beginning. Say amen if I haven't lost you yet. Oh, hallelujah. The attitude of me first had become so ingrained in the leadership team. I'm talking about top leadership. Yeah. That it had become an organizational problem. So Jesus is sitting at the table and he tells the disciples that he's about to leave. My hour has come. Not going to be with you guys much longer. And familiar conversations began all over again. If he's leaving, who's on first? Who, 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 who's on first? Who's going to sit on the right hand? Who's going to sit on the left hand? Who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? What am I going to get? What are you going to give me? What is going to come my way out of this situation? And it is that kind of spirit that infects much of the world today. What am I going to get? What's in it for me? What's coming my way out of this? And we can have a praise service anytime we want to. All we have to do is preach about what people will get and preach about favor and preach about your next and people will dance and people will shout and people will cheer. But when you preach about serving yeah, all right. for an anointing, Come on. when you preach about serving as a means to grow yeah. and move to the next level, mm -hmm. does anybody in the house have a shout of praise for Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yeah. Marriages stay in trouble because everybody gets married thinking about what they're going to get out of the relationship without any consideration of what they might have to give. Marriages without purpose, couples who are not focused on serving stay at each other's throats all the time. They keep a long list of I didn't get this and you didn't do that and I'm not happy about this. Say amen or owe me one. Amen. And then 
to top it all off, selfish people raise selfish children. Everybody in the house in a competition to see who can do the least. I see some housewives smiling and clapping. And the crazy thing about it is women who end up doing a lot of the chores at home incredibly do not want anyone making their children do nothing. I'm not trying to mess with you. I'm, I'm just trying to see you. I'm just trying to see you. I'm known strong women. I'm talking about hard women don't take no handout from nobody. I'll get it by myself or I won't have it. Strong women lose their mind because somebody wanted their teenage son to get up off of their rear end and sweep a floor. And I, 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 can't, I can't compute that. I can't compute that. Listen to me. If they never learn to work at home, how do you think they're going to react when the person writing their paycheck says, I need you to do this, I need you to do it this way, and I need you to do it now? They're going to feel like they're being abused because somebody expects them to serve. Somebody expects them to actually work in exchange for a paycheck. <laughs> They'll be shocked out of their mind. They'll be continually bouncing from one job to another. Yeah. Now, I may have some mamas mad at me. Right. But I believe in training a child to work and to serve. Yeah. 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 I gave Judah a broom and started telling him to sweep stuff when he was five. Sir Lenny said, he's too small for that. He can't do a good job. I said, but he's going to learn, sweetheart. It'll be all right. He's going to learn. He'll grow into it. He'll grow into it. Somebody needs to say, it's your job to wash the dishes, and it's your job to wash the clothes, and you're going to vacuum, and you're going to get all the dirty dishes and bring them to the kitchen, and you're going to sweep. If you're not training your family to serve, then all you're doing is training them to eat and to eat and to eat. And you are part of the problem in America today. Go ahead and break. Amen. that don't know how to do anything but take. People that don't know how to do anything but eat will be in a mess because they have been prepared to live in a world that does not exist. Ain't nobody but mama and grandmama gonna do you that way. It, it don't work that way outside of right there. And so these people are constantly going from job to job. They're never happy. They're, they're, they're never satisfied. But people who train their children to serve are people who will always have a place. They will always have a job. They will always have a place in the workforce. They'll always have a place in the church because their anointing to serve will make a place for them. Some folk come and, and they want you to put them in charge of something. But they want only that and they are unwilling to serve anywhere else until it's possible to put them in charge of that. And you can't do anything with them. You can't do anything with them because anointing comes through serving. See Elijah. Read your Bible. And other folk come in wanting to serve and willing to serve anywhere that there is a need. To them, the need is the call, and they try to be involved in anything and everything that they can possibly help with. And because of their attitude and their anointing in their life, 
They'll be leaving something real soon. Because promotion follows that kind of anointing. That kind of anointing. I'm out of time. i got to skip all them pages. <laughs> Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 14. I went slow. I was worried about y'all. I didn't know how y'all Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 14. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. Talking about saving you from your sin. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness. Wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee and do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power. And the might of mine hand has gotten me this well. Don't forget what God has done for you. Don't forget what God's done for you. He said, He said, I led you through a great and a terrible wilderness. I led you through times when people were trying to kill you. And I brought you out the other side. I brought you through situations where people were working against you. They were trying to run you crazy. They were trying to push you over the edge. You were in a great and terrible wilderness. And I brought you out on the other side. I made a way for you where there was no way. And you come out on the other side just fine. I fed you with manna from heaven. I put miracles in your life you wasn't hoping for, wasn't expecting, didn't even see, and I provided for you when there was no provision coming from nowhere else. Everybody else had dried up on folk who were ride or die buds, and they're gone, and you can't see them nowhere. Jesus was there the whole time. The whole time. And we talk about praising him on credit. We talk about praising him on credit for something that he's going to do. Jesus is sitting in heaven going, you owe me a praise this morning. You ain't got to praise me on credit. You need to praise me for saving your life. You need to praise me for bringing you out of that club alive. You need to praise me that you survived that night in that car. Oh, my God. Where has he brought you from? Talking about your classmates already died. They already OD'd, but you sitting here this morning. Yeah. Folk who were in the house the same night as you, they got shot, they went to jail, and here you sit. Yeah. Ain't even got no charges by your name. Yeah. Who's on first? Who's on first? If he's on first in your life, or if you're going to put him back on first, I dare you to stand up and praise him like you mean. I dare you to stand up and praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all can thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.